Okay, this is really amazing to me. It is a comparison of human, chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan chromosomes. And you see how really similar they are. And you always hear about how similar we are. You know, 95%, 90% sharing the DNA and all. So it really makes it look like, it really makes it look like we descended from them. But they don't mention that we share about 50%. You'd be looking at a lot of similarity with a mouse up there. It's amazing. It's amazing how you can be fooled by these things. But let's talk for a minute about what the what Anunnaki were up against when they wanted to create us. When they wanted to create a creature in their own image after their own likeness. And they said, well, okay, we're not really well adapted to Earth. And we know that because in the cylinder seals, they're always shown, as you saw those gods, fully dressed, fully clothed, with things on their heads. And the humans are standing there, you know, maybe in loincloths or naked. The humans are, are better adapted to the planet than they are. So they said, okay, we're not really well adapted. Let's take some genes from the creatures of Earth. And they say that we shall build, take some of the creatures of Earth and, and use it as a model. So let's assume they use an arm like Xana. And so we've got some of her genes, but mostly we're going to have their genes where they want us to be like them. But they've got a problem, and it's a big one, because they themselves must have, must have 46 chromosomes. Why? Because we, among primates, alone among primates, have 46 chromosomes. And so when they start with the Alma, they've got a creature with 48 chromosomes because all the primates on Earth have 48 chromosomes. So you've got 48 chromosomes here, and you're the Anunnaki, and you've got 46. How are you going to put this together? How are you going to make a living zygote to begin the process of, of manipulating? How are you going to do that? You've either got to do one of two things. With the, the sperm and the egg, you're going to be looking at a 24-23 mismatch in chromosomes. How are you going to make that? You're not. You've got to add a chromosome to the 23, or take away a chromosome from the 24, which would be the creature of Earth, or add a chromosome to your own self, neither of which will work because you won't have the same creature. And it's just too much DNA to fool with. You can't do it. There's only one way to solve this problem. You have to take the 48 chromosome, the one with the 48 chromosomes, and you have to fuse two of them together so that they only take up one space and now you've got, even though you've got 48 chromosomes, it's taken up one space and you can match it up with a 23 and you can get to work. Am I right? Do you understand me? Next slide. Look at our second one here at the orangutan. Second and third, gorilla second and third, chimp second and third, but human. Uh-oh. Somebody fused those two together. Now, we're told Mother Nature did that somehow, some way. You know, it's like... Everything else had just happened by magic. The Anunnaki did this. There's no way otherwise for that to happen. And it's some of the clearest evidence that there is. That we're genetically manipulated, genetically put together, and genetically created. And furthermore, we're told that we're like primates, that we're primates. When we don't have primate bones, we don't have primate muscles, we don't have primate skin, we don't have the, hymen, uh, the primate hair pattern on our body. They're light in front, thick on back, we're light on back, thick on front. What's that about? We don't have their heads, their brains, their arm length. We don't have anything that's primate. We don't have primate sexuality and we don't have the same number of chromosomes. How does that equal primate? It doesn't.
fuimos visitados en el pasado y posteriormente creados genéticamente por una raza de reptiles humanoides? Aunque todas las evidencias apunten ineludiblemente hacia esa dirección, quien ostenta el poder mundial oculta esa realidad con el fin de que sigamos ignorantes sobre nuestros orígenes, pues este conocimiento podría tambalear las bases de todas las religiones del mundo y en gran medida causaría una revolución social sin precedentes que obligaría al sistema educativo a modificar todas las enseñanzas y a la ciencia actual tendría que admitir la invalidez de sus postulados. Entre el 10 y el 14 de abril del 2003, en plena invasión de Irak, el ejército de los Estados Unidos saqueó el Museo Nacional de Antigüedades de Bagdad y robó grandes cantidades de figuras, tesoros y tablillas que nos hubieran revelado mayores detalles de la conexión reptiliana de los Anunnaki. El 80% de los 170.000 objetos que albergaba el museo fueron robados y destruidos. Durante el saqueo, un incendio en la Biblioteca Nacional de Bagdad destruyó archivos de incalculable valor. At the fantastic diversity of genetics and expressions of life that we can see in this tiny 10% and less of this one little frequency range, then you kind of think outside of this frequency range is infinity. If entities had not evolved, through the reptilian stream, when you look at the unbelievable diversity of the reptilian species in this tiny little 10% of the, of the universe that we can see, in this little frequency range, then it's not that it's fantastic mm -hmm. that this species could throw up a form that is humanoid and has a, 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 an intellectual intelligence. It's actually uh, staggering if it had not done so. I, I, I spoke at this, this conference in America, and um, I talked to this guy who uh, ran a magazine, and he was a real straight Christian patriot guy, right? not into all this, you know, stuff. But and he said to me, you know, I like your stuff. He said, I like all your political stuff and, and all your secret societies. He said, but I have a real problem with this reptilian thing. Right? And the shape shifting. He said, I can't get any head around that. So fair enough, not a problem. Just take what you like and leave the rest of it. So anyway, um, the next day, I walk into the area where he is, and everyone's in the conference listening to somebody. And so the, the room's empty. He said, oh, I've got to talk to you. He said, I told you. He said, last night he said, um, I met this man um, who had a real problem with me because of something he, I did that he didn't like, something I wrote he didn't like. He said, and he got angry and angry and angry, and he was screaming, you know, kind of, kind of totally lost it. He said, and the, the hotel manager came over and said, look, hey, can you take this elsewhere, please? You're upsetting the other customers. So he, he thought, I'm, I'm out of here. I can't take this anymore. And he went to the elevator. And as the elevator doors were, were closed, this guy, still at it, comes in the elevator right in his face get absolutely livid and uh, he said he shapeshifted in front of me so he was then much more open to the fact that this is no illusion this is conditioned to believe that people manifest and entities manifest as like human bodies because that's the conditioned mind reacting and I understand that But any conditioned mind that says, I am not going to look at the evidence, I'm just going to dismiss it because it is so different, is a conditioned mind that is unbelievably uh, imprisoned uh, while thinking it's free. We, we are given a conditioned reality that is so different from what's actually happening that that gap, that chasm, 
between what, what we're conditioned from cradle to grave to believe is reality, the movie screen, and what's going on is so great that lots of people can't make that leap. And uh, that's not by accident, that's by design. This whole idea that the world is going to take up arms against, um, take up arms against God himself astonishes me. I understand people not believing God or rejecting God, yes. I can't imagine going after him warfare. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Why would the world go after him? I think, I, I think, I think the uh, Nephilim thing will explain it. You know, it's interesting that the alien types, if you read all, you go, through, you wallow through all this literature, Dr. Mark Eastman and I spent a lot of time this, going through that stuff, you'll discover there's three types of these so-called alien creatures that emerge. The greys, those are the diminutives, short, little, you always see them in the, in, the, in the entertainment media. There's another group that seem to appear, that's sometimes called the Nordics or the Palladians. They, they, they're it's about six foot tall, they're blonde, blue-eyed, they look like people. Could be around us now. And there's a third group that are the most grotesque of them all, what they're sometimes called the reptilians. These are scaly, weird creatures that look like a refuge from some grade B science fiction movie. There's weird stuff. Well, these three always, these three always show up. It's interesting, in Revelation 16, verse 13, 14, I've always wondered, how does the world go to war against God? And John tells us, I saw three unclean spirits like what? Like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. I think God is going to use some kind of strange creatures, demonic or whatever, to draw the world into this confrontation that is part of the, 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 the climax that Revelation and the Old Testament deal.